Colin Howard is a recent recipient of the Oral Yankee Award. This is an award that stems from the SOC organization that we're continuing each year. You can look for an article in the upcoming magazine about Ron and his career, but it's better to be here front and center and hear from him directly. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ron. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ken, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Ken, to, for the invitation to give you a quick, uh, about a 20-minute tour of 40 years here and um, to cover my uh, research career at CDC South. I spent all, of, all of, uh, 39 years working for Alberta Agriculture and all at Brooks, which is very unusual to stay in one spot. But I found that over the years, the job was always challenging. No two days were the same, and if I ever wondered what I was doing there, sitting in the office. I just needed to look out the window and see the fields and the crops and be reminded that I was there to serve the greater good of agriculture and uh, more specifically with uh, plant disease uh, control. All right, so just a bit, a bit of a, a brief introduction to, uh, to my career. Um, I was hired by Alberta Agriculture in 1975. I just graduated from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and uh, came directly to, to Brooks to take up uh, a role uh, operating the plant disease diagnostic lab that had been established there in 1974 by my predecessor, Bart Bolin. Uh, prior to that, they had had one provincial diagnostic lab for crops in Edmonton. There was a lot of volume coming out of southern Alberta and the decision was made that, uh, to set up a satellite uh, lab in Brooks. I went beyond that uh, role though uh, in the years that followed to uh, get into applied research extension as well as diagnostics. For a while I did uh, some management work heading up the lab services section and then the, both the horticulture and new crop development units of Alberta Agriculture. And we had staff in, in Olds, Edmonton and, and Brooks in those roles that I, I traveled and got to know. Uh, what was going on in agriculture in those areas. And I served three years as the director at CDC South. So I had a chance to be a bench scientist, field scientist, and uh, do some administration along the way. Initially, my specialist responsibilities were in southern Alberta, but my job eventually grew to having um, a um, province-wide responsibility. And I think in my time at Brooks, I've worked on diseases of virtually every crop that we grow in southern Alberta. Now Alberta in 1975 was a, a bustling place and the population was a little less than two million people at that time. It was uh, Premier uh, Peter Lougheed was our, uh, our Premier then, uh, Trudeau was our Prime Minister and it was the oil industry was, was booming and Brooks was one of the fastest growing communities uh, at that time. Um, Lethbridge hosted the uh, Canada Winter Games um, in 1975. And as far as agricultural research stations went, of course there was the research station here at Lethbridge and um, there was uh, also research stations at Lacombe and a full-fledged station at Beaver Lodge which was later wound down. And um, Alberta Agriculture had facilities at, at Brooks and Edmonton and then of course the University of Alberta. So there was a lot, of, a lot going on in, in the province in terms of its economy and, and in agriculture. Now there were uh, quite a few plant pathologists back in 1975. Um, here in Lethbridge there were six full-time plant pathologists, the largest staff complement now. They're down to about three. There were two in Lacombe, one in Beaver Lodge, uh, three profs at the U of A and three with the Canadian Forest Service. So there was a, a nice contingent and uh, the provincial government was beginning to build its, its capacity there as well. Alberta Agriculture's main role in those days was uh, extension. And they had 50 district offices around the province staffed with district agriculturists, district home economists. And they were a real engine for getting information out to the producers and serving as a two-way conduit of what was going on out in the rural areas coming back into headquarters in Edmonton. The Alberta Hort Research Centre where I was based was uh, the, one of the largest horticultural research stations in Canada at that time. We had at one time uh, a dozen or more scientists working there 
in all aspects of horticulture. And the plant industry lab in Edmonton was the main lab that took in plant disease, insect, and weed diagnostic samples, and we were a satellite lab uh, to them. There were a lot of interesting diseases going on through the years. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I visited the University of Minnesota and had a chance to meet an extension plant pathologist there named Howard Bissonette. And he said to me as a young graduate student, he said, Ron, have faith in the fungi, they'll always keep us in work. And that was a, a true, a true a statement. Through the 1970s, the concerns then were smuts and root rots, uh, snow molds, powdery mildew was a very serious problem on our soft white wheat, and um, the uh, wheat streak mosaic, uh, which is a, a mite-borne disease, was ravaging our winter wheat as well. White mold uh, was a problem on a number of crops, and uh, bacterial ring rot was a disease that showed up occasionally in our potatoes, and we at the lab at Brooks um, handled all of the diagnostic samples on ring rot from the collections that were made during the annual field surveys in those years. In the 1980s, we began to see black leg and black spot coming up in our canola. A new disease called verticillium wilt came into our alfalfa fields in the south here from BC and Washington and caused a lot of concern. The leaf and head blights were starting to become more prominent on the cereal crops and the, the root rots and leaf spots were beginning to show up on our pulse crops as we intensified the production of those. Through the 90s, um, we saw the, the stem uh, leaf and leaf blights and white mold, again, continuing to be emerging problems on the pulse crops as we expanded production up into central Alberta and the Peace region. The leaf lesion complex on our cereals and fusarium head blight was starting to make an appearance and blossom blight, a disease caused by Botrytis and Sclerotinia, we began to show up in our alfalfa field, not only here in Alberta, but elsewhere in Western Canada, causing some concern over losses in yield and quality. And a new disease, Fusarium wilt, began to show up in our canola fields. And fortunately, the breeders got on that fairly quickly. Resistant varieties came out and the disease virtually disappeared. In the 2000s, there were a lot of major uh, diseases that reared up um, club root and black leg. Um, black leg had been around for a number of years, but club root was a new disease that came in. We had a year or two when we had epidemics of aster yellows, attacking not only broadleaf crops, but also cereals as well. And stripe rust began to make a, a annual appearance in southern Alberta. It used to be very sporadic through the, the 90s, but uh, in the 2000s it became an annual problem and spread actually over into the eastern prairies as well. Root rots on pulse crops, um, um, again, were predominant with the discovery of Aphanomyces, a new root rot in peas, and we began to have a few epidemics of late blight on potatoes and tomatoes, and uh, the, the disease was actually developing in some of the urban areas like Calgary and Edmonton and seem to be spreading beyond those into the commercial potato fields and sometimes it was vice versa. So in, in the time I, I've been at Brooks, I've worked on a lot of different crop disease combinations and I wanted to go through, um, I'll call them four success stories, uh, interesting projects that we were involved in that uh, um, I think you'll, you'll find interesting. Okay, the, the first one was a potato tuber indexing <laughs> program that we did at Brooks. Um, in, in the 1970s, the potato growers were actually allowed to maintain their own clones of potatoes. And so some of the, uh, the farmers had actually selected clones of potatoes that did well on their farm, and they were able to propagate and sell those as seed. Later on, that gave way to a centralized tissue culture program and that was no longer allowed. But in the winter months, we used to receive those potatoes and uh, check them for uh, the presence of diseases. White mold uh, was, became a major problem on dry edible beans, and even to this day is a problem that we contend with. We did a lot of the early work on that, looking for better management strategies. <clears throat> Verticillium wilt of alfalfa came into uh, Alberta in the late 70s, and continued with us through into the 80s until we developed resistant varieties. 
and there's some interesting work I'll talk about there. And then lastly, club root on canola, which we found in Alberta in 2003. We knew it as a disease on vegetables prior to that, but when it moved into canola and took a run at one of the more valuable crops we have, a lot of people stood up and paid attention, a lot of money became available for research. Now in the tuber indexing, you can imagine in the winter months we would get visits from potato growers and they would bring with them a box of potatoes that was their hand-selected tubers out of their fields. And those are very valuable and um, we would take a, an eye out of each potato with a coring tool, we would germinate it, we would grow them up in the greenhouse and then we would take leaf samples and we would test them for diseases and they had to be disease free and the tubers that were found to be disease free were returned to the growers and they would cut them up and plant them and that became their nuclear stock. We looked for uh, diseases like bacterial ring rot, potato viruses, X and S and spindle tuber and did visual examinations for a number of other diseases as well. So the tubers that were disease free were turned back to them and that became their nuclear stock. We also uh, conducted at that time what was called the Alberta Potato Seedlot Trial, and this was patterned after a trial in Washington State. And at Brooks, we brought together small samples of all of the seedlots of potatoes grown in Alberta. We planted them side by side in the field. I had inspectors from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that came in, and uh, we went down the rows and we flagged every disease plant that was there and then we brought the growers in so they had a chance to see how those seed lots were performing under our conditions, what diseases they had and how vigorous they looked and that sort of thing. So that attracted large crowds of growers and we, we ran that on into about the mid uh, 80s and then interest sort of, of died out and that uh, was no longer done. But in its Haiti, that was a very popular uh, program. White mold on dry beans, uh, the, the bean industry started in the, in the 70s in, in, um, in Alberta. Uh, lots of growers had moved up from Idaho and areas like that. And white mold caused by sclerotinia was a very bad disease. The varieties that we were growing at that time grew very flat and low to the ground. They were called semi-viney. And we used to do annual surveys for this disease and there were a number of fields that we went into where 100% of the plants had white mold. It just looked like the field had been torched. So it was very difficult to get yields over, up to or over a thousand pounds an acre. Today, we, we manage the disease much better and we're getting yields up to 3,000 or more pounds. But in those days, that was hard to achieve. We looked at a number of uh, management strategies such as deep plowing to bury the sclerotia, flame cultivation to burn them, wide row spacings, foliar fungicides, irrigation scheduling, resistant varieties, um, soil applied uh, biofungicides like Coney Ethereum, Minotans, and various uh, sprayer um, trials that we did with different nozzle types and water rates and that work is continuing uh, to, to this point in time. So we um, we put a lot of these uh, trials out in, in producers' fields. This is a flame cultivator, which is a propane device that burns uh, the stubble. But you know, beans don't produce much stubble, and so there was never much to burn there. And uh, the, uh, so flame cultivation was a sort of a bust. It didn't, it didn't really work. But we were looking for anything and, and, and everything in, in those days that might be novel and, and possibly work for the producers. Verticillium wilt uh, on alfalfa came into Alberta in the late 70s from Washington State, probably born, uh, seed born. All the varieties that we were growing that time were susceptible. And this disease uh, very quickly kills the, uh, the plants. This is a vascular pathogen and when you plate out the pieces of stem tissue, you can see the, the pathogen growing out. And um, we looked at, uh, we did disease surveys that, that showed the disease was confined more or less to the irrigated areas in southern Alberta. We looked at the host range and the, most of the verticillium species we were dealing with here, uh, alfalfa was the preferred host. There were some resistance breeding that went on at the Lethbridge station here and the variety barrier was released in the 1980s and that um, 
cause the, the disease levels to, to drop. Um, Henry Wong, who was a, a plant pathologist here at Lethbridge, looked into insect transmission and seed contamination. We did some seed treatment work and ultimately Thyram was registered as a seed treatment. And we looked at spread on farm equipment and survival in soil, dehydrated uh, alfalfa products and silage. This is just a shot showing some mesh bags with alfalfa stems that we would bury in the soil. And after a year or two, the stems would decompose and the fungus would disappear. But as long as the, uh, the stems remained intact, it, it could survive for several months. Cutter bars and uh, haying equipment turned out to be the major means by which this was spreading. The verticillium fungus sporulates on the lower stems of the plant, so when the cutter bars go through, they get contaminated with the sticky spores, and the custom operators that were going around doing swathing uh, were really spreading this disease quite widely. Um, Henry Wong, um, um, the, the plant pathologist at Lethbridge, also looked into insect spread and he discovered that insects like aphids, uh, their legs get covered with these sticky spores because they stay down low in the canopy when it, where it's cool, and that's where the fungus was growing on the stems. He also found grasshoppers and other uh, weevils and other chewing insects became contaminated. And in the case of grasshoppers, they actually would ingest the spores and would end up in the feces. So these the insects were, were moving it around. And leafcutter bees who uh, we were using at that time for pollinating in the alfalfa. They were cutting leaf pieces from these diseased plants, packing them into the, uh, the shelters, and they had verticillium in them as well. So it turned out to be there were a lot of different mechanisms of, of spread for this disease. Um, the alfalfa cubing plants, and there were three or four of them in southern Alberta at that time, were handling a lot of this infected hay. And so we looked at whether or not it would survive the dehydration process, which consists of drying and, uh, and, and pressure, uh, creating the cubes under, under pressure. And we found that uh, low amounts of the verticillium did survive the dehydration process. And the work that we were doing with the, the plants at that time, their major market was Japan. And Japan did not have this disease at that time. And so we never published this work out of concern that it could impact negatively the alfalfa exports. But uh, the, the cubes did, uh, some of them did have low levels of, of verticillium. We also looked at uh, whether or not silage would, silaging would kill this alfalfa pathogen. And uh, this is a silo bag with my technician at that time harpooning pouches of verticillium infected stems into the center of these bags. And we found that the heat and the acid production during silage and siling killed the organism. So silaging of, of the hay was a safe way to, to manage it. Club root on canola is probably the, um, the most potentially catastrophic disease that I've worked on in my career. This uh, disease, when it came in in 2003, all of our varieties were susceptible. And club root is a soil-borne pathogen that causes these galls on the root. It's very prolific. It forms uh, millions, if not billions, of these resting spores in, in the uh, infected tissue. And these are able to live for many, many years in the soil. So when this uh, began to show up and started to kill out uh, alfalfa uh, stands, or, or um, uh, canola stands, there was a lot of concern. In 2003, the first year that we discovered this, there were 12 th fields in just north of Edmonton in Sturgeon County, and it was an accidental discovery. Uh, an agronomist, uh, Dan Orchard, who now works for the Canola Council, brought samples into Dr. Tawari, a professor at the University of Alberta, who identified it as, as club root. And um, every year after that, um, there were annual surveys, and this is the, the map of the club root infested area today, so all these these uh, uh, counties that you see with red, blue, or yellow have uh, confirmed cases of, of club root. And in 2014, uh, almost 2,000 fields in 36 counties had been confirmed to have this disease. And it sort of made the uh, uh, Alberta, especially central Alberta, the epicenter for this disease in Western Canada. It has been reported in a few fields in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, but we're definitely the, um, the club root capital. 
And because of the potential uh, damage this, this could cause to the canola industry, there was a massive research effort and millions of dollars poured into uh, research establishments in Western Canada. And at one time we had probably up to 50 scientists and postdocs and technicians working on clubroot and made us a world center for clubroot research here in Western Canada. Uh, some of the lines of investigation that we were involved in, of course, was doing disease surveys, uh, determining the strains or pathotypes, looking at uh, new uh, canola varieties for resistance, looking at soil and water erosion as, as means of moving the uh, pathogen around. We looked at liming and fumigation techniques that are used in, um, in growing vegetables that are affected by club root, but um, we took a look at some of those vis-a-vis uh, -vis the canola production systems. Looked at seed treatments and seed contamination because we found that the club root pathogen is carried in dust on the surface of the seed. And uh, it's not a seed pathogen per se, but it's carried uh, along. And looked at spread on farm equipment, vehicles, and machinery. The main means by which this disease uh, seems to spread is on equipment working in fields. And, uh, on big tractors and so on, you can get hundreds and hundreds of pounds of contaminated soil easily moving from field to field on this equipment. But it's not just farm equipment, it's vehicles, it's uh, if you have oil and, oil and gas activity there, recreational vehicle users, there's many means by which it can spread. So we looked at sanitization of equipment uh, using disinfectants and other protocols in our research. <clears throat> we also did some um, work uh, with um, Ag Canada Lacombe and the University of Alberta looking at soil erosion using these dust collectors. And we had these set up at a field near Bassano where, where there is club root. And in some of those traps, we, we trapped up to 220,000 club root spores per gram of soil. So wind erosion could be a major means by which this disease spreads from, from field to field. <clears throat> some of the work done by Dr. Uh, Strelkov at the University of Alberta, we found club root resting spores, you know, clinging to the seed of a lot of different crops that were grown in club root infested fields so that during harvesting and field activities when the dust gets mixed uh, in with the seed, you can find club root spores on, on canola, of course, wheat, rye, barley, and even on potato tubers that were grown in club root infested, so that earth tag uh, serve to potentially uh, act as a spreader, spreading mechanism for, for this pathogen. And so in our, our sanitization work, we developed protocols and strategies for cleaning and de disinfesting equipment. And that we did some seed treatment work as well and that showed that a lot of the commonly used seed treatments do knock back the viability of the club root spores, but nothing was available that eliminated it. <clears throat> So that's sort of the highlights of some of the research uh, that we've done. But in my career, I've seen a lot of, of technological advances. The uh, personal computers were just starting to come in in the, in the mid-70s, and they've really revolutionized the way in which we store and analyze data, manage our information, and communicate. Um, in the, in the mid-70s, the, the technicians at, at Brooks would often spend all winter just hand transcribing data into big log books uh, like you'd use for farm accounting and every, all this statistical analysis was, was, was done on, on a uh, calculators. Uh, nowadays it's uh, so much simpler and quicker to, to use the computer. The um, development of molecular biological techniques has, has really revolutionized plant pathology in terms of identifying pathogens, classifying them, and and uh, helping breeders to develop resistant varieties, and those advances continue. And um, commercialization of diagnostic testing methods has been revolutionary as well. We now have these, these dip strip kits that you can buy, and farmers can have the power of a laboratory there in their, in their shop if they want to uh, take samples of plants and, and test them with these, these kinds of kits. And of course, a lot of companies now are specializing in plant health diagnostics, and they are, are selling you know, thousands and thousands of these kits into to, um, seed producers, to uh, commercial producers, to other companies that deal with the production of disease-free seed. 
Um, some of the, 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 I'll call them logistical advances that I've seen over the years have been the creation of alternative funding sources for uh, funding research, such as checkoffs, royalties, uh, organizations like ACIDF have sprung up and growing forward. When I started with Alberta Agriculture, we were not allowed to accept any, out <coughs> excuse me, any outside funding. We totally relied on A-base funding. But now it's almost a 180 degree flip where to do research, you need external funding. Your A-base funding provides salaries and, and your uh, facilities, but to, to actually get money to do the work, you have to go out and, and compete for grants. <clears throat> the development of research networks, uh, like the Club Root Risk Mitigation Initiative, has really, uh, I think, pushed forward um, research, uh, not only in plant pathology, but in a lot of other areas. We're like-minded scientists network together and uh, move towards common goals and attract large amounts of funding to do their work. And the diversification of research capacity, uh, the applied research associations like Farming Smarter stepping up and doing a lot more in the research realm. It's not just left to academia or government anymore. The applied research associations are performing a major role there as well as some private sector research farms that seed companies and, and crop protection companies have, uh, have had as well. And to sort of end things off, looking ahead to the future, I, I think technological innovations are going to continue to pave the way towards new discoveries. We're already seeing the advent of these sort of self-use plant diagnostic aids, uh, the test kits I mentioned, but uh, there are now crop-specific cell phone apps that uh, you see for turf grass and tomatoes, soybeans, where you take a picture of the diseased plant, it matches that picture against the database and gives you probable causes, and then you click other buttons to look at management techniques pesticide applications and so on. <clears throat> I think that the day is coming and there are already prototypes of sort of handheld analyzers where you take a, you clamp the, the, the device onto a leaf or take a drop of sap and it, you put it on a, a, this, a, this, this a machine and it will analyze it much like a, a blood test for us and tells you, gives you a, a lot of different results. And, tells you what the probable pathogens are and what the sort of status of the overall plant health is. And then the use of digital diagnostics where we can take pictures and videos and send these around to specialists all over the world to get answers to crop health problems. And you can actually take a virtual tour of a field. I've had some consultants come in with their laptop and take me on a virtual tour of the field, showing me all the pictures that they took at different spots in the field where there were diseased plants and I, I didn't have to set foot in, in the field. I think we'll continue to see advances in molecular uh, biology, uh, using uh, our knowledge there to enhance uh, natural resistance mechanisms in plants to sort of turn, turn on uh, resistant mechanisms that uh, may help to ward off diseases or using genetic engineering to enhance stress tolerance in plants, stresses of, in the environment as well as diseases. <clears throat> and we're seeing more and more whole genome sequencing in plants and pathogens where we actually have a map of the genome and we know where, where the genes are that control certain functions. We can switch them on or off to make the crop more resistant to disease, for example, or the pathogen perhaps less able to attack the plants. And I think we'll see um, uh, designer pest control products. We're already seeing the advent of a lot of, of uh, fungicide chemistries, for example, that target specific metabolic pathways. And as we better understand through some of the genome work, where sensitive genes are in the pathogen that can be targeted with these products, we'll be able to design pest control products that will do an even better job than the products that are, are with us now. So that's a quick um, overview of, of my career and uh, some of the interesting things uh, I've done. I was very fortunate to um, end off my career with a, a succession plan for my position. And Dr. Mike Harding, who's here, Mike, just hold up your hand there. We worked in parallel roles for two years before I retired. And uh, Mike now has uh, the realm of uh, the reins of the plant pathology program at Brooks. And uh, he'll be your go-to guy doing 
plant disease work out of uh, CDC South. So I'd just like to end off by thanking Farming Smarter for the, the chance to come and give you a little bit of a um, uh, retrospective on my career this morning and to thank them for all the good work that they're doing. It's, we've had uh, a lot of good conversations and worked on a lot of good projects over the years and I'm glad to see that's continuing. And thanks to those of you in the audience that I've had the pleasure to work with over the years. It's been, it's been a lot of fun and, um, and I've had a, a good career and I, I hope you've enjoyed uh, hearing some of the highlights of it. Thanks a lot.